Improving our understanding of Great Lake Reef habitats for lake trout and coragoning. Three case studies using a multi-beam echo sounder. Uh, please welcome Joe Johnson from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know there is an equally enticing lake trout habitat talk happening right now in the other room. So um, it's actually one of my co-authors. I'd like to acknowledge Lucas Latart. So please do make a point to watch that YouTube video when it comes out. Um, and with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the co-authors actually on this talk. So I'm gonna go through three different reefs and our research questions at them, which would not be possible with such a dynamic group of people. So, um, one of the main hypotheses driving the low recruitment of lake trout and coragonids currently in the Great Lakes is potentially that degraded habitat is um, reducing the early life stages. And so I'm going to talk about three different research questions we have at three different reefs and walk you through them geographically. So first off, can we use habitat surveys to inform site location for restoration projects? And how do our current studies compare to historical and previous studies done at those same locations? How can we use habitat data to improve studies on early life stages? And can we develop techniques at smaller reefs that can be scaled up to larger ones? And if we build it, will they come? And how or can we even measure physical degradation between years at uh, newly installed reefs? So I'm not really going to talk about the methodology too much, but if anyone has any questions, please come find me after this talk, and I'd be happy to nerd out with you on the details. Um, but basically, we send sound, we listen for it to come back, and then we can measure depth and intensity of the substrate. So we have a Norbit multi-beam echo sounder. This is a really high-end unit, and it gets amazing resolution, a uh, very, very fine resolution. We have it mounted on a Boston Whaler, and then we ground truth all of our sites, uh, all of our sonar data with uh, underwater video, and we have it mounted to a cage uh, with fixed reference uh, sizes so that we can kind of really get an idea of the size of substrate when we're looking at the videos later on. So for our first question, um, if you were hopefully here just before the break for Pascal's talk, uh, I'm gonna pick up sort of where he left off at Brockton Shoals. This is an area that historically is known to be really good lake trout habitat, but currently is not being utilized. And this effort is being led by the DEC Lake Erie Unit, and so we came in to help them um, try to identify some site locations for a restoration project, and also uh, take the advantage of the previous studies at that same site location to see how it compares. And so Etzel et al. in 1992, they used side scan imagery at this area and um, you know, back then, that was a really high-end image. Uh, you see these nice uh, sinuous waves, kind of, but you don't really know what that is. It's pretty hard to discern. Uh, but that was cobble substrate over sand. And then Gorman and Mackey went back to the same area, and they did find those cobbles and boulders um, also in that sand area. And then there's also a lot of worn bedrock around it. And so um, this is the area that we scanned this past year in relation to the Edsall and the Gorman Mackey sites. Uh, we did a little bit of a patchwork approach and this is the um, bathymetric data at a five meter resolution. And so the Gorman and Mackey area is that rectangular area coming down and Edsall is up at the top. So this is just one piece. This is uh, the focus area that they wanted us to really zero in on. Um, and so this overlaps with uh, both those other areas. And this, is, this data is actually gridded at a 20 centimeter resolution. So this is a very high resolution. Um, image right here. And this is about um, 50 to 60 feet or so. So it's pretty deep for Lake Erie. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have the backscatter. So when you're looking at backscatter images, the darker the picture, um, the softer that return. And so that's probably softer substrate, whereas the brighter returns is going to be, you know, harder rocks. 
Uh, and so when we wanted to compare our photographs, that top photo, um, that's the kind of lake trout habitat that we dream of in the 1990s, but again, with the sea lamprey um, levels being so bad, that wasn't really being utilized at all in that time. And then at the bottom, we have a side-by-side -side comparison of the Edsel and the Gorman and Mackey. So by 2009, we can see all of those cobbles had been invaded by Dreisenids. And then I cherry-picked two, uh, two of the worst photos for you all um, from this past year. So we've got cobble substrate really colonized by Dreisenids and uh, quite a bit of fine sediment accumulation in certain areas. So we took 113 still images that are geo-referenced um, and we uh, used those to train a random forest model, and so we used our bathymetric data and our backscatter data, and we also used uh, VRM, which is one type of rugosity measurement, and BPI, which is one type of relative position. So where, in, where is one cell in relation to all of the cells around it, height-wise, high or lower? Um, and so this is just the first stab that we took at it, but uh, these are the results of the random forest model. I don't really have time to get too much into the CMEX, but this is the new modified classification schema, uh, modified past Wentworth. And it has the introduction of muscle reef and muscle hash as categories. So in this figure, the greens are actually bad. Green is garbage, purple's good. Um, purple is gonna be your boulders, cobbles, gravel mix, and greens um, are your fine sediments and your muscle accumulation. And so um, you still see this uh, sinuous pattern in that focus area come through after the random forest model. Um, and this is at a one meter resolution gridded, but uh, just looking at this and then also talking with the team at Lake Erie Unit about some of the field logistics, so certain depths and proximity of sites that might be candidates for restoration, we kind of came up with those two sites, but um, could be subject to change. So uh, Brockton Shoals conclusions and next steps. We were able to use the habitat study to, and uh, you know, our own knowledge together to identify two candidate spots that may be ideal for um, cleaning and restoration projects for lake trout. And the habitat is definitely clearly degraded by fine sediment and dry cenin mussels, um, but the underlying habitat still does remain um, compared to the historical ones. So the next steps, it became abundantly clear that 113 uh, pictures is not enough for this area, so we need additional video drops most likely to validate the model and then refine some parameters um, and test out what works best. Uh, things like slope and aspect could have been included. And then uh, we can overall define all of the areas that could be restored and hopefully move on with a pilot project uh, to potentially do some experimental cleaning uh, at these sites. So, Moving on, uh, going over the falls into Lake Ontario, we're gonna head to Olcott Reef. So this is a man-made reef in the 1980s uh, for lake trout, that lake trout t uh, are seeming to utilize. And uh, we wanted to know how can we use the, our habitat data with their multi-beam to improve studies on early life stages? And can we refine and develop our techniques that can be scaled up at a basin-wide level? Um, this is one of our research priorities for lake trout in Lake Ontario, so this is why this is of interest to us. So these data are gridded at a 10 centimeter resolution, um, and so uh, it doesn't actually hit land like that crude base map might suggest. Um, but when we zoom in on just the reef, uh, we can take a look at the slope and the aspect of this area. Um, and so you can see from the slope figure, the brighter area, the higher the slope is. And so you can really see that some of that contour from the individual rocks, it's such a small reef. Um, the aspect is actually kind of interesting because we do have um, situa uh, like situational positioning that is uh, 